Today, we're going to be sharing the podcast I was recently on. I had the opportunity to be interviewed by Sandy Cruz on the Sandy Cruz Nutrition Podcast. Sandy Cruz is a dedicated registered holistic nutritionist who believes that your health should always be a top priority. So we are totally in line. And this time we talked about fatty liver, why it's common and how to heal it. It was so much fun to be interviewed on Sandy K's podcast, which is why I want to share it. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this one. And of course, if you're not already subscribed, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you won't miss out on other topics. So let's get started and let's discuss what you could do to heal fatty liver. I'll see you soon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sandy K Nutrition Health and Lifestyle Queen. Today with me, I have a special guest and her name is Dr. Efrat Lamandra. And today I'm so excited. I polled my audience on what topic you really wanted to do a deep dive in. And you guys mostly said fatty liver. I mean, we hear about this all the time. It's like this mysterious diagnosis. All these people have fatty liver. So we're going to break it down today. And with that, welcome, Dr. E. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this. But of course, I'm going to ask you, how you got into this field of medicine or holistic health or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, functional medicine, probably. So yeah, this is, an, this, I, this is an important story. And, you know, I want to make sure your listeners are probably like, oh my God, I don't want to hear about this autobiography, but there's, it's a good story. And I think it will help you also understand some of your providers out there. So the story is that I first started EG Healthcare, which is a primary care practice. So think of your PCP, you know, pediatric adults, we do house calls, we do all these fun things. But I, like many of your PCPs, many of your listeners are experiencing, I had patients who would come to me and said, I don't feel well. And I'd say, okay, well, your labs are fine. So, you know, I'll see you next year. And, you know, I, I now recognize the amount of frustration that must have given my patients. But at the time, I had no idea that there was more. And so for those of you listening who are frustrated with their PCP, don't be frustrated. We didn't learn this. So I did the best that I knew with the tools that I had at the time. Um, and then my wife got sick. And I think anyone in integrative functional medicine has either been sick themselves or someone that they love got sick. Yep. Because if you think about it, um, listeners, there's no only crazy people go back to school after they went to school already. Yeah. So we go <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. I had so many people call me crazy. What are you doing going yes. back to school? You're 49 years old, for God's sakes. Exactly. So we all go back to school again for something. And everyone in the classroom, virtual or otherwise, is there because conventional medicine is wonderful, but has too many limitations. So... I went back to, you know, I'm not going to go through my wife's whole autoimmune issue, but ultimately we ended up in functional medicine, functional medicine. I had never heard of it at the time. This is pre-internet. And I was like, this is not going to work. This is nonsense. And this person had the audacity to suggest that nutrition has to do with health. So, because <laughs> wow. you never learned that. Anyway, fast forward to many years later, many classes later, later, many patients later, I realized that there is such a better way to practice. It's still Western medicine. It's just Western medicine done right. It's just Western medicine with a pause, take the time, listen to the story, get to the root cause and talk about things other than the medication algorithm. And so that's where the new method was born. And it's really empowering patients to understand that their symptoms are not in their head because so many people come in and say, some variation of I've been told it's in my head from literally being told, oh, you're it's in your head to, oh, maybe it's just your hormones. And what do you expect? You're a new mom or what do you expect your postmenopausal? And of course you're just stressed out. These are all variations of it's in your head. Would you like an antidepressant? Maybe you need an anti-anxiety. Um, I actually just finished a consult earlier this morning with someone who ended up an in inpatient psych as a result of side effects of her disease and her medication. I mean, psych, inpatient psych. Wow. And then she finally had someone listen to her and took her off medication that was actually causing it. So bottom line is it's not in your head. <laughs> yeah. It's just the people you're going to who are very 
good people, very well-meaning people, they do not have the tools necessary to take you where you need to go. Yeah. That's the whole story. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I feel that story myself, as we talked about a little bit offline, I have been there myself where I had to figure it out, but this was also almost pre-functional medicine. Functional medicine has really come into play, especially it's really a lot bigger in the U S and guess Mm -hmm. what? Canada, not so much. I mean, it's there, but not like it is in the U S it's really kind of flourishing. People are getting it that we need a little bit more insight into our wellness. Dig a little deeper, right? Yes, absolutely. Dig a little deeper, understand why, right? We need medication, not against medication, but the medication is dealing with the symptom really. And then you need to know the why. So let's just like, let's just go for something that people understand intuitively. Obviously, if you have diabetes, you need medication, but the why is the sugar you're consuming, right? So that's a kind of linear understanding of it, but that's true for everything. It's true for everything. It's true for autoimmunity. There's medication for your autoimmunity, but it's not curing you. It's there's no why. So you have to get to the why. And mm-hmm. that is something that we don't really do in conventional medicine. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. <laughs> so, you know, this is a pretty good segue into, you know, why so much fatty liver these days and what oh is it? God. What is it? So let's start with what is it exactly? Okay. So what is it? I I like to explain things in a really um, basic level because that's how I understand things. And I'm prefacing that because I'm sure there's a hepatologist out there who might be listening, who might say I'm oversimplifying. I am aware that I'm about to oversimplify. (laughs) It is purposefully done. So, so here's the thing. Okay. So fatty liver basically means, and we'll talk about that in a second, that part of your liver has been replaced. Instead of having liver cells, you now have fat cells there. And that's going to be a problem because your liver cannot function optimally if it's not 100% liver, right? So there used to be a time where people who had, oh wait, and let's just say this, there's a progression. There's fatty liver, and then you know, some fibrosis happens and then you can get cirrhosis of the liver and then also cancer of the liver. So there's levels. Okay. Mm-hmm. So fatty liver, let's talk about it as like, kind of like the entry level of liver damage. It used to be a time where really, really the people who had this was secondary to alcohol, right? There's a, right. For, right there's for our generation, there was a conversation like, oh, the liver problems, were they, was they, were they a drinker? right? That was kind of the correlation. If you drank alcohol, you probably had liver problems and people's basic understanding is, oh, well, the liver had to process a lot of alcohol, probably hurt the liver. I could see why the liver got hurt. Okay. But what we've come to discover now in this generation is that we have more people with non-alcoholic fatty liver, which means something else that the liver has to process all the time that is causing damage. And that tends to be the standard American diet. Mm-hmm. And, and let's explain why. So again, oversimplification for all you hepatologists out there. Um, <laughs> so I doubt that they're listening to us, but just in case. Um, so every single thing that you eat gets broken down to glucose more or less. Yep. And then you, you have insulin and insulin's job. It's like Uber. It picks up the glucose and it Ubers it over to the cell And the cell says, thanks so much. I was really hungry. Thank you so much for this. And everyone goes on their merry way. But then we eat a little bit more than we need to. And so now we have this more glucose and insulin picks it up. And it's like, hello, cell. I have some more glucose for you. And the cell's like, no, thanks. I'm I'm full. I'm good. I I did not order this Uber ride. And the insulin's like, no, you have to take it. What am I going to do with it? And their insulin and the cell have this argument of who's taking it. And that's called insulin resistance. Insulin resistance causes inflammation. So now insulin is like stuck with this glucose. So one of the things the body does is, oh, let's send more insulin in. <laughs> Maybe if we send more insulin in, the cells will take it. That works for a while. And the insulin kind of forces the glucose into the cell. But after a while, the body's like, okay, what am I doing with this excess glucose? It is trying to prevent getting diabetes. 
If it drops the glucose in the blood, that's diabetes. Our finger stick goes up. We see sugar in the blood. That's diabetes. So there's going to be several years before, as you're consuming all this glucose before the body gets diabetes. And it does a few things. It creates belly fat. It's trying to find storage for this glucose. So you get like your attic and you put it in your basement and you put it in your garage. So it tries to find storage. So it puts it in belly fat. Um, it, and the other thing it does is it creates a fatty liver. It coats the organs, the viscera, the viscera with fat. So it's kind of like, it's part of the insulin resistance picture. It's part of the pre-diabetic picture. And is part of your body trying to manage all this extra stuff that you've asked it to process. So bringing it back to our initial conversation, if the alcoholic liver is the difficulty in processing all the alcohol, the non-alcoholic phallic liver is your is the body's response to having to process all these extra glucose. That is probably the best explanation I have ever heard on <laughs> I love the Uber. I'm gonna <laughs> use that. I love that. That's so good. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So that was like the most perfect explanation. And I would argue that any of these specialists listening would not say it's oversimplified. I think that's exactly how you should describe it to everyone. Thank you. So, yeah. So, okay. So that's what happens. Now let's talk about how diet comes into play. So we, we know standard American diet. So what's part of the standard American diet that can cause this issue? So carbs, it's a carb overload. And let me specify not carbs, right? Cause then someone's going to say, well, vegetables and fruit are carbs. I don't mean those. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the super starchy, non-nutritional carbs that make up the bottom of the food pyramid, um, the standard American diet is problematic because you are not designed to process all of that. Just like you're not designed to drink that much alcohol. You're not designed to process that many, that much refined starch and sugars. Um, and it's not necessarily just sugar. So for those of you who say, oh, I don't really eat cake or I don't really eat sweets. This conversation doesn't apply to me. Yes. If you're eating pasta and bread and pizza, even if it's whole wheat, um, it's just too much. You're, you're asking your body to constantly manage what it doesn't need. Um, and that, and that is the problem, the standard American diet. And I'm just talking like basic, right. And then we're talking, of course, there's other elements, right. Which is the toxins and the GMOs, but let's just keep it super basic. It's an overload of unrefined sugar and starch that your body was never designed to manage, mm -hmm. which I'm sorry, which, okay. which is, that earlier question, which is why do so many people have it? It's because so many people consume the standard American diet. We are at a, tw at a, at a, and the lowest states affected, we're at a 20% obesity rate countrywide. Some states have up to 40% obesity rate. Now, this is not a weight conversation. This is not a body shaming conversation. I can have people with insulin resistance and fatty liver who are thin. I'm just saying this points to the fact that the standard American diet is very prevalent, which is why fatty liver is prevalent. That makes a lot of sense. And I always say it's all the white stuff. So white, white rice, rice, white rice, white bread, um, white pasta, white, and too much of it, just like what you said. I mean, you know, we should primarily have our plates with all these beautiful vegetables and a little bit of protein. And then if you want to have a little, and I call it filler, because I do this coaching, even with my mom, I'm like, mom, less of the filler, right? Mm. That stuff I consider filler. There's nothing nutritionally great about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, and, and try and explain that to somebody who's older. What about eating too much? Like uh, not just eating too much, sorry, too often. What do you think of that? If you're constantly snacking and eating all the time. Okay. So before I answer that, I do want to say that it's not that while the white stuff is dangerous, if you're eating a lot of whole wheat stuff, it's still going to be a problem too, or brown stuff, right? Carbs okay. are carbs. Mm -hmm. Because I say this only because a lot of people who are really trying are like, but I don't understand this happens. I'm eating whole wheat bread. 
Yeah, but you eat half the loaf of whole wheat bread. Yes. Or sometimes yes. people say, you know, I'm, but I ate gluten free cookies, but you still ate like 10 gluten free Oreo cookies, right? So it used to be a time where telling people to stay off of white brought them naturally to a healthier option. But now there are so many fake healthy options that are purposely confusing to people. So if you're one of those people, you know, no one's mad at you. It was designed to confuse you on purpose that you'll buy it thinking you're eating something healthy. So it's really, it's really going to be about, you know, trying to make your plate look like you said, as many colors as possible. So eat the rainbows, but not Skittles, Mm -hmm. have some animal protein, unless you're ethically against it and very minimal fillers. I like that word fillers. Um, As far as eating too much. I don't know where you stand, but I'm a huge fan of um, intermittent fasting. So in my world, that means, and what we recommend to our patients is 16, eight. And when I explain that, then I can answer your question, right? So 16, eight means you're fasting for 16 hours and you eat for eight, 16 hours includes your sleeping time. So nobody panic. So for example, if you wake up, if you go, I'm sorry, your last meal is at seven and you stop eating. Um, and then you go to sleep, I don't know, around nine, 10, the next meal you have is a breakfast, 11 o'clock. Yeah. So seven to from 7 PM to 11 AM. This is a classic, um, schedule. It doesn't have to be exactly this way. You are fasting. What happens during that fast is it's kind of the, it allows your body to rest. It allows everything to rest. So you are reducing insulin resistance. You're reducing inflammation. You're taking time off, right? You don't want to work more than an eight hour shift. Why are you asking your body to work digesting food forever and ever? So then when you start your eight hour shift of eating, to me personally, it doesn't matter how often you're eating during those eight hours, if you're eating quality food. So if you want to graze all day, that works for you. That's fine. If you want to eat one or two solid meals during that eight hours, it's fine. What you want to avoid though, is spikes in, in insulin. In other words, you want to avoid grabbing a high carb snack throughout the day. Cause you'll notice that in those eight hours, if you eat a quality protein and some fat, you're actually not that hungry. But if you grab a handful of like cereal, you're actually starving within 10 minutes. And then you're grazing because you never actually ate anything substantial. So if you're grazing while eating substantially more power to you, but if you're grazing because you're constantly eating non-nutritious foods, you might want to rethink that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, and I also feel it's very individualized too. You know, Mm -hmm. I was a big faster and I've done up to five days fasting. Mm -hmm. And then now for me, personally at this stage in my life, I'm 53 and I'm not, I wish I was done menopause, but you know, I'm still kind of, I'm still getting a period now and again. And so I'm not really there yet, but I feel like I need to, I needed to shift things. But Mm. of course, one of the things I had to shift was less of those carbs. And it's really helped me a lot. And then also, you know, having breaks between like pretty good breaks, like five hours between each meal, I am finding that that's helping me. So, um, I think it's like you said, you know, like too much, too often, no breaks, the bad food, you know, all of these in combination are going to give you a problem, right? Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought up menopause. I know that's kind of, we're coming back to fatty liver. I promise everyone. But I just want to say, because you never know what will resonate with someone, but since you brought it up, um, a lot of women who suffer from typical symptoms, right? The hot flashes and the palpitations, a lot of what you think is hundred percent hormonal could still be from your food. So when I work with my patients, I am a huge fan of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, but I do not start it at first because I first clean up nutrition. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, a lot of the palpitations and hot flashes go away, which is, which is really important because you want to see how much of that is nutritional. So for example, if you are someone who is used to having, you know, some pasta and a glass of wine for dinner, 
you're probably going to have night sweats and palpitations at night. And it has yeah. nothing to do with your hormones. It has to do with you processing all the sugar as you're going to sleep. You're going to think it's your hormones. You might run for hormone replacement therapy um, when in fact it was your pasta and wine. So you want to make sure you tease that out first before you embark on the hormonal journey. I like that. Yeah, I, I agree. And I see it myself and I'm a nutritionist and, you know, I ate and eat clean, but it's just, I was eating the wrong foods. Mm. And so in terms of menopausal symptoms, I have very few, which I'm pretty, I'm pretty lucky so yeah, far. That's really so let's, good. Just, that's really good. let's keep it going, <laughs> right? Good. Let's keep yeah. it going. Um, okay. So what, how do we know if we have fatty liver disease? Like what are the symptoms? Mm, it's a bit of a silent um, killer. Yeah. Um, because there are no symptoms. So you can make assumptions. There are no symptoms. So the only way to really know is an ultrasound because sometimes even your liver enzymes can be normal. And let me explain why. If you are in the beginning stages and just some of your liver is now fatty, the liver is functioning. And so the liver enzymes that you get on the blood test are an indication of function. And if your liver is functioning well, they may not get elevated. There may not be enough injury for the liver enzymes to be elevated. So you'll go to the doc, do your annual and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. The test is called a CMP and you know, when your liver enzymes there will be fine. And so you might think, Hey, I know I don't eat well and I'm, I have a few extra pounds on me, but my liver enzymes are fine. I must not have a fatty liver. That's incorrect. In fact, the way to know would be with an ultrasound of your liver. But why would you even get an ultrasound of your liver? Because you have no symptoms. So what right. you'd, never, you'd never go and get one. It tends to be found accidentally. Like, hey, I have abdominal pain. Maybe I have a gallbladder issue or something else. We send you for an abdominal ultrasound for something unrelated. And then we talk to you about that unrelated thing and say, and by the way, you also have a fatty liver. That's usually how it's found. Yes. Okay. Okay. There's a few questions I have immediately as you say this. So you often will go and get your annual blood work and they will check your, what is it? ALT, AS, the, the liver enzymes. Correct. And is it true that by the time you see those liver enzymes elevated, it's already pretty progressed issues with it's the liver? It's already pretty progressed, but it's not too late and it's not irreversible. Right. Right. Yes. Cause it the liver already... is a regenerating organ, right? We yes. need to specify that. Yes. Liver has the potential until it's, until it's, you know, fibrosed and cirrhotic, which is mostly irreversible. I have seen some pretty intense cases, but it's mostly over. Let's just say for the purpose of this conversation, that it's irreversible. If okay. it's not, if it's, if it's just injury and there's no cirrhosis yet, you can reverse it. Um, and if, but if you do see those elevated, so let me just say this elevated liver enzymes, there's a spectrum. And I just want to caution everyone that if it's really, really high, like in the hundreds high, it's probably not just fatty liver. Something else is going on. Make sure you get that checked out. Okay. okay. We're talking about like a small and elevations. Um, then you probably fat, you know, dealing with fatty liver and it's reversible, but if you're like 300, 400, something else is up. Um, so yes, it exactly for that reason, exactly because you can have fatty liver for a while before liver enzymes go up. It is an indication that things are progressed. Yeah. And also as a functional medicine practitioner, I know I did a, I did a course in functional diagnostic testing. So I just know a lot about it. And I know that the ranges can be different. So mm -hmm. if you look at some of the, I guess if you follow Western medicine, the ranges on some of the measurements in the blood work will be considerably different than functional levels. Does right. that make sense? Because yeah. Western medicine kind of follows more like individuals who are already sick versus optimized levels, which is where you want to be, right? Yes. Um, I think, yeah. So what you're referring to is um, when we look at lab ranges and you look at your, your paper, yeah. you know, and you're like, Hey, this is, should be from 10 to 15. 
that's an average that was created by the lab companies. How did they come up with that average? They come up with that average by taking the cohort of all people who are sick, including people who are in the ICU. And this is over time, of course. And that's how those ranges are there. So when we look at these ranges, these averages, right? It includes the sickest of the sick. Yeah. And, but in conventional medicine, we still use those numbers. But sometimes in functional medicine, when we want to optimize, this is especially true like in, th- in with thyroid, when we want to optimize, we have tighter windows that we allow. Um, but I would say that when it comes to liver enzymes, elevation is elevation. Like you're not going to say someone's elevated at, you know, I don't, I don't know that necessarily it, it applies here. You're not going to miss it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I just, I wanted to mention that because really that's a main difference in terms of like, you still do all the lab testing, you still do all that, but there's certain measurements where you want to optimize, but okay. That may not be applicable for liver enzymes specifically is what you're Correct. saying. Right. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. How, so then does the gallbladder go first? Is that true? That usually you'll start to see issues with the gallbladder and then that'll be your signifier that there's also something going on with the liver or no, no. Um, oh, okay. Let's let's, it's probably happening at the same time. Okay. 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 So it's not a cause and effect. You will see that a lot of people with fatty liver also have a gallbladder issue, but not because it's causative. Okay. The same eating pattern creates disease in both. Oh. Okay. So, so let's talk about gallbladder for a second. Gallbladder's yeah. entire job, right? So the liver does a million things. The liver is like, so it's, the list is on and on. One of the things the liver does is produce something called bile. Bile is like the secretion. Um, and it's in charge of helping us process fat. So when the liver creates all this bile, it sticks it in a sack and that sack is gallbladder. Um, so gallbladder just holds bile and its job is, it's just storage. And anytime you eat something fat and fat does is, is good stuff too, like olive oil, avocado, anytime you eat something fatty, gallbladder wakes up. It's like, Oh, here you go. Here's some bile. And it releases some bile. Um, and his job is just to do that all day long. If everything's functioning, you don't even know you have a gallbladder. Everything's wonderful. Um, however, you can be someone who whose bile is a little sludgy. Think mm-hmm. of like wet, hot tar. And that sludge can also become stones. So what co- causes sludge and stones? Standard American diet. Mm. The other thing that could happen to a gallbladder is that it gets sluggish because it's supposed to kind of squeeze, it can get sluggish, standard American diet gets lazy. Now, that is for, now I'm not talking about emergency gallbladder issues. Emergency gallbladder issue, if you were one of those people who went to the hospital, you had to get removed, that is because the sludge or the stone, instead of hanging out on the sack, got caught in one of the ducts on the way out, created a blockage. That is an emergency situation, has to come out, that's an infection, that's a big deal kind of not what we're talking about. Okay. So if you want to people had to have it removed because it was a level 10 pain, you had fever. Okay. That's kind of like the, the worst end of the spectrum of the sludge stone scenario. Mm-hmm. But many of us, again, discover that we have gallstones by accident, incidental finding on imaging, right? The people who had pain, they're out, they're getting it removed, but many of us don't even know it's happening. Just like we don't know we have a fatty liver what we're eating is creating the sludge. What we're eating is creating bile that's not high quality. The liver is not producing high quality bile. It's hanging out in the gallbladder. The gallbladder is a little bit lazy. It stays there and then it becomes stones. So it is happening simultaneously. And that's why you see it because it's the same, the same thing that's causing this fatty liver is also causing this sludge and stones. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And, um, you know, a lot of times people will experience some pain too, right. In their gallbladder, you know, like the yes, the so, lower. So once the pain is there, that means that there's probably some stones there. 
Yes, it's either sludge or stone. So, so remember I said that if the stones get stuck in the duct on the way out, it get, creates a blockage. Yeah. Level 10 pain got to go. But for some people, the stones and the sludge kind of goes in and out of the duct. Like it kind of, it you know, it goes in a little bit and it goes out. So you have an avocado or a French fry or whatever. The gallbladder wakes up because now it, that's, it's doing its job and the stone gets stuck there for like a second. So it's like, oh my God, this hurts so much. And then it calms down. The sludge or the stone come, goes back to its place and everything normalizes. So for some people, you can have like gallstone, like gallbladder attacks yeah. and not necessarily need to have it removed likely you're going to be, uh, it's going to be suggested that you're going to remove because why wait for it to get blocked? But in this world, in this conversation, if this is happening to you, it's actually an opportunity to, ch- to turn your life around, turn your nutrition around because it's a sign of what's to come and it can be reversed if you're in that stage. You're in the stage where you have some attacks every so often, um, you know, and you're not already in that emergency state. Right. So can this, can these stones dissolve with a change in diet, maybe some therapeutic supplements, that kind of thing? Conventional medicine says no. Right. Right. Functional medicine says yes. You'd okay. have to be really, but this is not a supplement game. Okay. Like this is not, I'm just going to take some ox bile and it's going to go away. Right. No. It's never, by the way, it's never just a supplement game. Like yeah. if you're not doing the nutritional work, if you think that a magic supplement is going to help you, it's not. Right. So if you're going to totally reverse it, change your entire nutrition, you know, uh, really uh, up your game and do supplements. Yep. It can be reversed. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And then what about things that you can do? in addition to diet to help it? Like, can you do things? Cause you know, some of the things that I know I do just, I don't have gallstones, but I like to ensure optimized bile flow. So I'll drink dandelion tea and things like that. What do you think of that? So when you said other than diet, as, as long as it's with diet. I don't want to say diet nutrition with nutrition, right? As yeah. long as it's with nutrition, right? Yeah. I always, I always have to say that I know it's clear to you, but so many people ask me, you know, I'm, I'm for some odd reason, very popular on TikTok, And I keep getting comments all the time. Like what <laughs> supplements do you recommend? What supplements do you recommend? And I never recommend them okay. because I don't want anyone to have the mindset of like, oh, if I just take this thing, it's going to be great. It's not, it's not going to be great. If you're not doing the work, I cannot stress this enough. Um, And the easiest thing for me is to sell supplements. I have the platform. I'm not saying I don't sell them, but I really, (laughs) really don't talk about it like that. So if you're already doing the work, yes. So we're going to talk about milk thistle is wonderful uh, for your liver. Um, Dandelion is wonderful for your liver, but there's another component that we haven't touched on, which is, and this will come tie back into supplements, which is this. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is stage one, kind of like it's the beginning. And that could become NASH, non-alcoholic stadiohepatic something. You okay. have to look at Google it. Okay. NASH is the more severe form of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the difference between the two is inflammation. So you have the fat component and then you add inflammation to it. And now it starts to be NASH, which is more severe, which can again lead to cirrhosis. So this is the biggest deal, right? We want to be in the space of, can I still reverse it? Once we're in cirrhosis land, we can't reverse it. So now we have to talk about, well, what is that inflammation? What happened from NAFLD to NASH? What is that inflammation? So inflammation is kind of like where functional medicine lives. Like inflammation is, is again, of course it's nutrition and did you sleep enough and did you eat yeah. enough? Right. But, but inflammation also brings us to the microbiome, right? And so microbiome, for those of you who don't know, it's the world in your, it's the, it's the world of bacteria and viruses that live in your GI tract. And it needs to be peace and harmony between the good guys and the bad guys. If you have 
too many bad guys, it's not going to work out. If you don't have enough good guys, it's not going to work out. And there's going to be dysbiosis, which basically is a fancy word for unrest in your GI tract. And you might not have symptoms. It doesn't mean you're always going to be like in pain or distended. It just means that the bacteria that live inside you, FYI, there's more bacteria inside of you than there is you of you. Mm-hmm. Just so you know. So if they're not in balance, it's going to be a mess. So making sure you don't have dysbiosis is important for inflammation. And so that becomes a probiotic conversation, bring us back to supplement, making sure that the whole GI tract is, is on point, that we've repaired the entire GI tract, whether you know we're taking omegas, vitamin A, probiotic, right? So you want to kind of pan the camera out past the liver into what's happening in the whole tract so that we can make sure to reduce the inflammation and not go from NAFLD to NASH. Oh, wow. Yeah. We don't want that. Um, yeah. You don't hear that much about NASH, right? You don't hear right. that much about it. Yeah. You it, don't hear much about it because I, I, you know, everyone just calls it fatty liver, but there are levels. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then what about, I've heard of this and I'm not sure if you can even answer this, but when you have not is it nodules or cysts on your gallbladder or liver is that does that even make sense to you you can have nodules and cysts in your livers but that's not necessarily an issue of function oh it's not necessarily well, part of this pathway and why why would that even happen in the first place is that something that you should be concerned about not necessarily it's not it's not part of this pathway it's not like if you have nodules that you kind of ate your way there, it's, it's, it's a completely different pathway. It could be a different inflammatory pathway. Some people are more cystic than others. Some people are more nodule than others. It's not, ne- it's not necessarily part of this picture. In other words, you okay. don't have to, you don't have to develop cysts or nodules because you're in a fatty liver and vice versa. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Good question though. Um, yeah. Cause I've just heard of this before and I, again, you could have that without symptoms, right? Yeah. You can have a cyst or nodule anywhere without symptoms, but cyst and nodules on their own are not necessarily, um, health concerns. Right. Right. Okay. So now we, we talked at great length about diet and nutrition, I think, unless you want to add anything else to that. No, but what it. else can we do on top of that? Stressing the importance of nutrition. Okay. Um, sleep. Mm. You have to sleep for everything. So yeah. when we work with our patients, of course, we talk nutrition. Um, of course, we talk supplements. But then we talk next, we talk about sleep. Sleep is just as important as nutrition. If you're out here eating gluten free ice, but you're not sleeping, it's not going to help you out. Mm. You need to sleep. Sleep is healing. Sleep is restorative. Sleep has um, effects on your hormones, your, your growth hormones, your repair hormones. There, it's an opportunity to remove metabolic waste. You need to sleep. It needs to be a priority. And that's important again, because there are decisions that you're making in your day that are going to affect your sleep at night. Like if you decide to have an espresso at 3 PM, you're not sleeping tonight. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that decision, because you're tired to take the espresso is going to impact at night. If you decide to have a glass of wine, because it makes you feel sleepy, you're not going to sleep well at night. So there's a lot of decisions. If you decide to work out at night, you're probably, I mean, yes. be, there are some people who are fine with it, but most of us, it's going to be disruptive for your sleep. So you're thinking to yourself, oh, but I'm working out. It's a good thing. Never, um, you know, at the price of sleep, or some people say, I'll wake up four o'clock in the morning so I can work out before work. No, no, never at the price of sleep. So sleep is the next thing, movement and movement. You know, I get very agitated in conventional medicine because like a half hour of cardio. No, I don't, I'm not going to tell you how long because I don't know what you're working with. For some people, the thought of walking down the stairs is exhausting. And if that's your, if, if that's the goal we're working with, then I want you to walk up the stairs every day. And for some people it's, five miles. God bless you. So then that's your goal. So when I say movement, it's whatever your movement level is Mm -hmm. not to the point of fatiguing you. Cause then we have to deal with that. And then stress management. And when I say stress management, 
I don't mean it in the woo-woo sense, although I am very woo-woo, but it turns people off when you say it. I am letting you know that stress literally changes chemicals in your body. It is literally causing inflammation in your body. So even if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, stress, I'm a strong person. Like, it's not about that. It's about, are you managing your inflammatory pathways? And when I say that, I don't mean you have a stress-free life because I don't know anyone with a stress-free life. No. I'm talking about learning to manage stress. And that could be as easy as learning how to inhale and exhale because <laughs> we forget yeah. to breathe. I not mean, I don't mean you have to go to a tree hugging retreat, although that's nice. Yes. I wouldn't go either. It's not my jam, <laughs> but I am letting you know that sometimes just getting up and walking out of the room and taking a deep breath, that's stress management. So that is part of the picture as well. So you're not hugging trees. I'm allergic to like all trees. So no, <laughs> I'm such a New Yorker. It's crazy. <laughs> So, so my oh. wife drags me out to hikes and I'm like, you know, with my Zyrtec and she's like, this is so lovely. And I'm like with six tissues. I'm like, yes, honey, <laughs> this is so amazing. I'm so relaxed. <laughs> that is funny. Um, I'm all for that. All of what you're saying, because I know, and, and I guess really first off, have a little self-awareness and know the kind of personality type you are. I'm the kind of person <laughs> that gets, I, I can be very jumpy. I can be very reactive. I know myself. So mm. I have to work a little bit more at figuring out what stress management techniques work for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I use different devices. I used to do the Muse meditation headband. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Mm, yeah. I, I, asked, I stopped that actually, cause I found something even better because I'm one of these people that would be like, okay, I think I'm meditating. Am I meditating? I think I am. <laughs> yes. And then, and so I'm like, okay, I got to just like shut it off. Right. And so I figured out some tools that work for me, but I try and do it every day because it mm. affects my sleep. And I'm a 53 year old woman. That's, you know, it's, we're known to not sleep that well, ladies. And so what do you tell? Okay. Cause I, I don't exercise in the evening. Okay. I won't even do a power walk at night with my sure, dog. Sure. I will do a gentle stroll in the evening. Not now. Cause it's cold as hell, but you know, during the day I take my dog out for a walk. I work out at the gym that works for me. I do that a couple days a week. I don't exercise at night. I don't drink. I have one cup of coffee early in the morning. So I do all the things. I also dim the lights. I have my blue light blockers. I have all that. I have little personal rules. These are my rules sure. that I instill on myself that I don't scroll. You know how we can get into that yep, scrolling yep, yep, thing. Yep. I don't scroll past nine o'clock because I find, you know, those stupid TikTok songs, they get in my head, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, if you're doing all of these things, but you're menopausal, how does your practice help these women for sleeping? What yeah. do you guys do? Because sleep is important for everything, like you it's said. So the answer is, it depends. That's yeah. The answer, right. And that is really the answer you want to hear from your provider, because the difference between functional medicine and just conventional medicine is that we're not algorithmic. Yeah. All right. So you want to hear it depends. You want to hear that. Don't get frustrated by that because it depends. It should be customized, right? Okay. So you're someone um, that's already done a lot of things, but there's a lot of people who don't recognize. They'll say, but I need my phone to fall asleep. I fall asleep while I scroll. Sure. Eventually. But first mm -hmm. you've just hyped yourself up with like dopamine from all yes. the scrolling and you give yourself 16 negative messages because somebody else in your age group looks amazing. And why don't you look that way? And so you've already like beat yourself up 16 times because your skin doesn't look like that or your belly doesn't look like that. And so like, now you're just have like, oh man, I really should do this. I really should do that. Cause there's no way you're not FOMOing. Right. And then eventually you get so exhausted that you drop dead asleep. Right. So, yeah. so just for those of you who think the phone's putting you to sleep, it's, it's not. <laughs> um, but for someone like you, I would say if you're truly, truly 
eating clean, doing all those things. There's two things I would say, first of all, how are your hormones? Because maybe you need progesterone, like oral progesterone. I got some, I got yeah. some <laughs> oral progesterone when it comes to sleep is amazing. Yeah. Not, not cream. Cream is great for other reasons, but the oral progesterone, because it's taken orally and as it goes to the liver, back to the liver, um, it has an effect that induces sleep. And it is like the most vivid dreams you will ever have in your life. It's phenomenal sleep. Yeah, I do that. I do it rhythmically. And those two weeks, damn, I sleep good. Yeah, right. Because you're you know? still getting your period, right? Yeah. So because so I, I had it in December. So that's why I'm still. I'm still doing the progesterone rhythmically, no estrogen, not yet. Not yet. Exactly. Soon, soon enough. So, um, yes, it is the best, most amazing sleep ever. And so then on the days that you're not taking progesterone, this would be a good time to talk about supplements. Okay, let's right? do it. So this would be a time where I would give someone, you know, melatonin. We have a really great, I wish I had it in front of me. Um, it's called sleep support by body health. Um, it's amazing because it has melatonin and it has a lot of L-theanine, has a lot of good relaxing supplements. You would be a great candidate for that because you have the sleep hygiene on point. Mm. So, right. Some people say melatonin doesn't work for them. Like, yeah, well, if you had three espressos and pasta and wine, melatonin is not working for you. Right? Yeah. You're going to need Ambien because yeah. you've just, you've just put so many chemicals in your body. This little tiny melatonin has got no shot. Yeah. And those people, it doesn't work for me. I'm like, of course not. Right. Um, so, but you would be a great candidate uh, for, for supplements because you have everything else checked off. So, um, what else now we talked about diet, we talked about, um, you know, foods, we talked about sleep. When are we going to get to the supplement talk for the liver support? Is it I now? Thought, I thought we, you know, I really did think we covered it. I mean, I think well, we, we, we touched on milk thistle and dandelion. Yeah. But does, so th here's please. a question. Here's a question. Does milk thistle support liver function or can it help regenerate the liver? If you're doing all those other things we talked about. Um, I, I, the reason I'm hesitating is because when you've changed your nutrition, you've removed the toxins, you remove the assault on it. So the milk thistle, I guess is part of the picture of regeneration, but the big piece is the stopping of the assault. Yeah. Yeah. The milk thistle is really important. And, you know, and then I have patients who even use ALA, like the list of things, because remember everything goes to the liver. Yes. The yes. list of things that you can use that are going to help glutathione, you know, it, the list kind of never ends. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm hesitating because, because all of it, right. Omega three, which is not necessarily for liver is amazing for it. Um, so it's all great stuff to really be able to figure out, is it helping regenerate versus is it the nutrition? I, I would have to say, I would say nutrition is like 90% and then that's like the last 10%. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts on liver detoxes? What uh, does that mean? So, okay. Here's, here's the thing. And I'm sure you've seen this in these natural health stores. You, they, and, and I, I, tell every single client and anyone who asks me, I warn, no, you can't go and buy a box off the shelf, call, you know, take a few things, drink some stuff and call it a day. And you've done a detox on your liver. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be careful with that, right? Because mm -hmm. if, because there's, can you talk about the phases of liver detoxification? Or do you not want to get into that? I guess I don't know what you mean by that. Like I know that what the commercial uh, is, but how are you detoxing your liver by taking more supplements that you're going through your liver? Dr. E, <laughs> this is what they sell on the shelves. Oh, I know, which is why I don't. Sell right. Anything. So this is why, you know, I always say like you food first, right? Mm -hmm. Just, just move your body. However, you're going to move your body. 
um, take some good quality therapeutic grade, like not Walmart supplements, sorry, Walmart or Costco. Yeah. Yep. Not that great. Um, and there was a whole uncovering about those supplements. And I talk about it all the time here in Canada. I think it was called W5. It's a Canadian show or marketplace, something like that, where okay. they did a big uncovering and they said, there is nothing therapeutic about Walmart supplements or Costco Kirkland <laughs> supplements. Anyway, but people think that they can go and buy a box at a health food store and do liver detoxification. I think if you fast and drink water, um, drinking water, if it's a short fast, if you're going for a longer fast as you did, just make sure there's some electrolytes. That is what liver detox could be. Um, mm -hmm. Because you're just giving it a chance to process. Like if it's processing, if you're detox, means you have toxins in it. Okay. So you have toxins in there. You need to give the liver a chance to process them. So if you could give it a break from having to process more stuff, you're giving it a chance. So what better than fasting to give it a chance to process toxins? Now, that being said, um, you know, some of the, some of the supplements, like I love glutathione, glutathione is, is, is amazing for this process as well. But again, you're asking the liver to manage it as well. So I would say fasting and water would probably be your best, be your best liver detox if there is such a thing as detox. And then there are certain things that are really, that it doesn't, you know, I don't want to get into mold, but like people who are dealing with mold are people who are like having trouble detoxifying, right? So then it's like, what do we, we have to decide specifically, what are we asking the liver to detox from, right? So if it's like, if it's mold, we actually are going to give, we're going to take binders and we're going to have the liver help kind of bind those toxins and take them out. So I'm hesitating because the sentence just, it doesn't mean anything. Like, what are we detoxing from? How are we getting it out of the body? Um, and, and yeah, so I would say colloquially, just give your liver a break. That would be a good detox. And then if you're really worried that you're having a detoxifying pathway issue, like like with mold, then you have to get very specific for the thing you're trying to bind and remove out of the liver. I'm sorry, guys. I know it should be easier, but it's not. I'm sorry. No, speaking of I binding. I want to sell you a liver detox box, but uh, I can't. You know, no, you know what? That's good. That's okay. I like that. But speaking of binding, what are your thoughts? Because I, somebody once told me that they're taking activated charcoal all the time. Mm. And I'm like, whoa, all the time, regularly, regularly. I don't know what that means because they probably just stopped saying it when I, they saw my face go, oh. <laughs> because like, what do you think of activated charcoal? I mean, that's a good thing if you actually have toxins in the body, but Correct. it also, it's like a magnet going through your body, right? Takes everything out. I mean, I don't know what this person is dealing with. You know, sometimes there's this conversation of more, people think more is more, um, but everything you take has a side effect. So there are times when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. There are times when you, it has to be really like, I, even the supplement, everything has to be for a reason. Like, why are you doing this? Don't do it just because your neighbor's doing it. So like, yes. so when I start with my patients, as we said, I always start with nutrition and then I see what symptoms are left. If all your symptoms are gone, great. We don't need to, let's just stop, just, just be done. But then let's just say you have symptoms that are maybe suggestive. I'm just going to say mold. Cause we talk about mold that tends to be more like brain fog, brain zaps. So certain things that you are like kind of you know, reminiscent of, of mold. That's a patient. Then you will do a test and you'll make sure that they actually do have the mold. You'll do a urine test, real-time labs for those of you who are interested. And then that person should be on a binder for a limited amount of time where you do a post-test and see that it actually worked. And then not only that it actually worked, but that the symptoms that you were trying to treat actually got better because maybe I got rid of the mold in your body, but if your symptoms are still there, then that wasn't the right thing. That wasn't necessarily the right thing to do. So limited time. And then you go on to the next thing. So then let's just say in your case, hormones would be next. We do hormone testing and we do that. So Everything should have a reason. It shouldn't just be more is more. It shouldn't be because it worked for the other person. There's a reason. There are some things that I like, like forever, right? Multivitamin, vitamin D forever. As soon as you stop taking it, it goes down. 
omega-3 forever. It's kind of think of the tin man. It's like the lubrication for a tin man everywhere in your neurons yeah. everywhere. Those are like your forever things, but something like activated charcoal, I would want to know why, for how long, um, what are we doing with it? Yeah. Makes sense. Now, how long does the liver take to regenerate or to heal or to just, you don't know? No, it, de- no, it, de- it depends on the, on the, on what we're talking about. Mm. It depends like, on how like, far okay. gone, how much. Okay. I know, but that's just, everyone wants to know, well, you know, how long before my liver looks beautiful again and is completely regenerated? Everybody wants to know. Well, the answer is like forever because as soon as you fall off the wagon, it's going to come right back. Yeah, yeah. Well, right? so that's true. people ask me all the time, how long do I have to be on vitamin D? Forever. As soon as yeah. you stop, it's going to go down. So I don't know the answer because I don't know how far gone it is. I don't know what they're doing. Some people think they're eating healthy, but they're not. If you're making like a 10 fruit smoothie in the morning with like stevia and honey and like, and you just really load it up with a whole bunch of sugar thinking it's healthy because it's all natural. You're not doing so. It's such a hard thing to answer because I don't know the starting point and I don't know what it is that they're doing to get them there. So once again, the answer is it depends. Okay. Yeah. And, and, And nutrition is subjective. It really is because you hear that all the time. Oh, I eat so well. And then, you know, you, right? So, yeah. That's a really good point. This is a story I tell about my wife all the time. So to paint a picture when this whole thing happened, when she was at the sickest of the sick, she was a very thin woman, very athletic. And I bring thin just to paint a picture, no body shaming at all, just for you to understand what we were dealing with. She was vegan at the time in terms of everyone, the epitome of health. She went into a regular, you know, primary care epitome of health, ate only healthy things, never ate junk food, never drank no reason for this woman to be sick. Well, it turns out, and she had two really intense autoimmune issues. She had PMLE, which basically is an allergy to the sun and severe psoriasis to the point where she couldn't, it was on her feet. She couldn't walk. Her feet would bleed. So really, really sick for someone who's so healthy, who eats so healthy, right? So we did testing and we found out that for her corn and soy, and this is before we knew that corn was the devil, right? We're old. So corn and soy, which was the staple of her food back then. There was no impossible burgers. There was the, if you were vegan, you were eating corn and soy all day. Yeah. But remove that from her nutrition. She completely healed. But if you would ask us back then, do we eat healthy? Of course we do. Yeah. We're, we're in the gym every day. We eat healthy every day. What are you talking about? We don't eat standard American diet, but it's not healthy for you. This is what yeah. I tell my patients. You, I had a patient recently, infertility issues, endometriosis, severe um, psoriasis in crazy places, making it very uncomfortable to live her life. We cleaned up her nutrition. Everything started getting better. She had one area that would not go into remission. This is a patient we did food testing on, and we discovered that it was avocados. Like in oh. a million years, I would never tell someone not to eat an avocado. It's a goddamn superfood. Yeah, yeah. So she was eating healthy. One of my most compliant patients lost massive amounts of weight. Endometriosis reverse. But until we removed avocados, she didn't get all of her results. So avocados are healthy, but they weren't healthy for her. So you might be eating healthy, but if you're suffering, you're probably not eating healthy for you. Your body's probably not liking, it's probably your favorite food. This woman loved guacamole. It's probably your favorite food you probably have classified it as this cannot be the thing. And it's probably the thing. Mm, Very good point. All right. Well, we've hit an hour. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to think that went so fast. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover off? Um, no, I just want to empower everyone listening that, you know, you're awesome. And if you're listening, you're already in the right space. You're already doing something for yourself. So keep doing it. I love that. Where can we find you? The company's called the new method, new spelled with a K because you always knew there was a better way. And the new method is everywhere. TikTok, Instagram, podcast, YouTube, website, everywhere except for Twitter. Cause I talk too much and <laughs> uh, 150 characters, not for me. <laughs> um, so find us private message us. We have, we are always looking. Um, there's, there's instructions, how to book a consult and Let's get you feeling better. And for those of you who do not have the resources to book a consult, I purposely 
every week, create content, free content everywhere for you to consume. So one way or the other, you can get there. Oh, that's so great. And that's probably another reason why you and I are recording, right? More yes, free exactly content. right. Exactly yeah. right. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure chatting today. Likewise. Thank you for your time.